This is a recording of a live online workshop on the multiphase optimization strategy, or MOST. The workshop took place on November 14, 2017, and was presented by Methodology Center Director Linda Collins. The recording consists of a one hour presentation, followed by one hour of question and answer, during which Dr. Collins answers questions posed by workshop participants. Without further ado, okay. here's Linda. Thank you, okay. Um, so I hope everyone can hear me now. Uh, this is an introduction to the multi-phase optimization strategy or most for development of behavioral, biobehavioral, and biomedical interventions. And be sure to be thinking of questions that you might want to discuss during the, the second hour. Here's an outline of my presentation today. We're going to review a few definitions just to make sure we're all on the same page about a few things. We'll talk about what's wrong with business as usual. We'll talk about uh, what most is and what is meant by optimization. And you'll probably be wondering at that point, okay, how do you actually do this? We'll talk about that. And then we'll cover a few frequently asked questions, but I'm eager to hear uh, the ones that, that you guys have too. So let's start with a few definitions. Well, what do we mean by a behavioral or biobehavioral intervention or, or biomedical intervention. This is a program with the objective of improving and maintaining human health and well-being, but very broadly defined. Uh, and uh, an intervention could be aimed at individuals, families, schools, organizations, communities, really any level, and uses a strategy that at least in part aims to modify attitudes, cognitions, or behavior, unless it's a strictly biomedical intervention. So a few examples are smoking cessation interventions, school-based drug abuse prevention interventions, uh, programs to help children who are behind grade, grade levels in reading. That would be a strictly educational outcome. Uh, I'm, I'm involved in a, pro a project to do this, develop an online intervention to prevent excessive drinking and risky sex in, in college students, and adult weight loss. These are all examples of behavioral and biobehavioral interventions. Also, a more uh, services-oriented intervention would be one to get HIV-positive individuals into the healthcare system and treated with antiretrovirals to get their, uh, to get their viral load down. I, I'm involved in a project to develop such an intervention. So one thing you may have noticed about this list of, of interventions, it's a very diverse list, but it has one thing, and they have one thing in common, most behavioral and biobehavioral interventions are made up of multiple components. So that leads us to the question of what is an intervention component? I use a very simple definition of intervention component, simply any aspect of an intervention that can be usefully separated out for study. There's a lot of different kinds of intervention, uh, intervention components and here I'm going to list just three different types. There isn't any need to uh, categorize components, but I think it's helpful to get a sense of the breadth of the concept. The type of intervention com uh, component that people usually first think of is a component that's a part of the intervention content. So each major topic to be covered in an intervention would be a type of component. For example, if it's a school-based drug abuse uh, prevention intervention, one uh, component could be uh, uh, public component not to use drugs. Another component could be aimed at uh, helping kids to develop resistance skills. Another component could be aimed at um, correcting normative uh, expectations about substance use prevalence. So each of those uh, could be a content component. But a component also could be something that promotes it, uh, engagement or compliance or adherence in an intervention. Uh, MEMS caps, that is caps that record the time that a pill bottle is opened. That's one type, uh, that's one feature that could promote compliance or adherence. Uh, something simple like providing uh, childcare for, for adults who are expected to uh, engage in an intervention would be, would be another possible uh, compliance or adherence component. A third type of component is something aimed at improving the fidelity of delivery of a component. For example, an 800 number that program delivery staff could call if they have questions, or uh, perhaps a, a number that they could text if they have questions, uh, some kind of special training given to intervention delivery staff, that would be uh, an example of, of, these are examples of fidelity components. There's something a little different about fidelity components, I think it's important to take note of this, that fidelity components are aimed at the person who is delivering the component 
and content and engagement uh, components are aimed at the target, at, at the at participant. The it's important to note, and this is why I have this highlighted, that some components may be pharmaceutical. So a component uh, could be nicotine replacement therapy, which is almost always used in smoking cessation, or it could be pre-exposure prophylaxis, prophylaxis in, in HIV intervention. Components can be defined at any level, the individual, the family, the school, et cetera, and, or, or at more than one of these levels at a time. And uh, it's, this is maybe obvious, but I think it's worth saying that uh, components can affect not only the, ethics, the efficacy and effectiveness of an intervention, but also its efficiency, its economy, and its scalability. Okay, so those are some basic definitions. What's wrong with business as usual? So how, this is how uh, behavioral and biobehavioral interventions are typically developed and evaluated. This is going to sound familiar to you, I think. Uh, intervention components are, are selected based on uh, scientific theory, clinical experience, perhaps uh, uh, recent uh, secondary analyses uh, an intervention scientist has done in his or her lab, et cetera. And then they're combined into an intervention package. And that package, as a package, is evaluated by means of a standard randomized controlled trial. I think you're all familiar with this experiment, usually called an RCT. Typically, there's two experimental conditions or arms, and uh, subjects, experimental subjects, are randomly assigned to receive the treatment package or to be in a, some kind of suitable control group. And I'm not going to, to stop here to talk about what might constitute a suitable control. That's kind of a controversial area and there's a, a lot of different possibilities, but let's assume you selected a suitable control treatment. And so the RCT would involve randomly assigning people to receive the control treatment or the treatment package. We're going to call this the treatment package approach, or sometimes I call it, I call it the classical treatment package approach. I think that sounds familiar to you because it's pretty much business as usual today in intervention science. So here's a schematic of the treatment package approach. There's some number of components, I have five here, but it could be any number of components. They are put together to form an intervention that's represented by the box here on this figure. And then that intervention as a package is evaluated by means of an RCT. Now here we reach a point in this presentation where I'd like to ask you, if you remember only one thing from our, our time together today, you remember this, what is wrong with evaluating a treatment package by means of an RCT? This is important, absolutely nothing. There is nothing wrong with evaluating a treatment package by means of an RCT. The RCT is an excellent experimental design and it was made for exactly this, evaluating a treatment package. And it works very well at doing that. But we've been asking the RCT to do an awful lot. We've been asking it to provide scientific information that it really was never designed to provide. The RCT is best suited for the question of determining whether a treatment package performs better than either a control or comparison group or some alternative intervention. My problem is right here where this circle uh, surrounds that arrow. My problem is with what happens between the time you identify components that are candidates for inclusion in the package and then formation of the package. Because under the current way of doing things, all of those components would automatically be put into the treatment package and then evaluated as a package. Let's take a few moments to discuss what the RCT cannot tell us. We know what it can tell us. Again, it can tell us whether a particular treatment package performs better than some alternative, but it cannot tell us some very important scientific information that we need. Suppose you conduct an RCT and you find a significant effect, which is great. What don't you know? This RCT that has provided a significant treatment effect does not tell us which of the components that went into the intervention are making positive contributions to the overall effect. We don't know whether the inclusion of one component has an impact on the effect of another component. It, it's possible that one component 
only works in the presence of another component or works great on its own but doesn't work in the presence of, of some other component. We can't tell whether a particular component's contribution offsets its cost, and that can be uh, very important. Now, in some interventions, the components all have about the same cost, but there are other types of, uh, of interventions where one component may be much more expensive than others. One example of that, one, one example of an expensive component is motivational interviewing. That's a very popular component for inclusion in uh, interventions these days, and it works great, but in order to work great, it has to be done properly. And to do motivational interviewing properly requires having highly qualified staff and training them really well. So an intervention scientist who's considering including motivational interviewing might want to know that motivational interviewing is moving the needle on that outcome uh, in a major way before going to the expense of including it. That's just one example. In general, the RCT can't tell us what to do next to make the intervention more effective, more efficient, and more scalable. And that's a little bit frustrating, not knowing the way forward to make the intervention even better. Now, suppose you're not so fortunate and your RCT comes out with a non-significant treatment effect. That's very frustrating, partly because you don't know whether any of those components are worth retaining. It could be that one or two of those components were great, and the others were just washing out the overall effect. You don't know whether one component possibly had a negative effect that offset or partially offset the positive effect of other components. And perhaps most discouragingly, you don't know specifically what went wrong and how to do it better the next time. Okay, so what's the alternative? What's the alternative to the treatment package RCT? Well, when engineers build products, and you can think of an intervention as a product, engineers build products all the time, they take an approach that's quite different from the approach we take in intervention science. They take an approach that's systematic, that's very efficient, <coughs> excuse me, and that's focused on the clear objective of optimizing the product. So the multi-phase optimization strategy, or most, integrates methodological perspectives from the behavioral sciences and engineering sciences. Basically, we've taken a number of ideas from engineering and adapted them for use in the behavioral sciences. And the idea here is that we can take those ideas to build optimized behavioral and biobehavioral interventions. Okay, so let's get a little more specific about what most is and what we mean by optimization. Most is an engineering inspired framework. And I say it's engineering inspired. It's not literally based on engineering ideas because the people who developed it, including me, were, were not engineers. Um, but it definitely is inspired by ideas from engineering. And it's a framework. It's a broad framework for development, optimization, and evaluation of behavioral and biobehavioral interventions. So using most, you can engineer an intervention to meet a specific criterion, and the criterion is selected by you, the intervention scientist. And there's many different possibilities for criteria. We're gonna talk about that shortly. But before we get there, let's take a moment to talk about four desiderata for behavioral and biobehavioral interventions. The first one we all know, effectiveness. Now, I should stop for a moment and say, um, there's an important distinction that's, that's drawn between efficacy and effectiveness. And everything uh, I say in this presentation applies to efficacy as well. I just don't want to have to keep saying efficacy or effectiveness. So I'm going to stick to effectiveness today. So effectiveness is the extent to which the intervention does more good than harm under real world conditions. Of course, efficacy is the extent to which the intervention does more good than harm under highly controlled experimental conditions. So effectiveness is an important goal for interventions, but there's three others that don't get talked about as much that I think are very important. First one is efficiency, the extent to which the intervention avoids wasting time, money, or any other valuable resources. A second closely related one is economy, 
this is the extent to which the intervention is effective, but doesn't exceed whatever budgetary constraints might be operating and offers a good value. Um, I wonder if I may, may stop for just a moment and uh, ask folks to uh, mute their, their mics if they haven't already, oh, yeah. already done so. Um, that would be helpful, thank you. Um, so uh, economy is different from, from efficiency because efficiency focuses on whether the intervention avoids wasting time. So essentially, uh, an intervention is efficient if it doesn't have any inactive components in it. And it's economical if it costs less than, or, or I should say no more than, whatever one's upper limit on the budget is. Scalability is the extent to which the intervention can be implemented in the intended setting exactly as it was evaluated. So an intervention is going to be evaluated in an RCT, and once it's established that it has a detectable effect, can it be implemented in exactly that manner without any need for ad hoc modifications? Now that's a tough definition of scalability, and it's, it's probably uh, more aspirational than anything, but I think it's, it's important to articulate what the ideal is. So the four desiderata are effectiveness, efficiency, economy, and scalability. And note that there's a fundamental tension between effectiveness on the one hand and efficiency, economy, and scalability on the other hand. You could probably have an extremely effective intervention if you didn't have to care about how much it cost or how scalable it was or how efficient it was. You could toss every component you can think of into an intervention if you don't have to worry about efficiency, economy, or scalability. Um, but we do have to worry about efficiency, economy, and scalability because we implement interventions in the real world and they have to be efficient, they have to come in under a certain budget, and they have to be scalable. Okay, so I've been talking about optimization, but I haven't really defined it. So let's define it now. Optimization of an intervention is the process of identifying the intervention that provides the best expected outcome obtainable within key constraints imposed by the need for efficiency, economy, and or scalability. Now here you see that fundamental tension I talked about a moment ago. You want the best expected outcome obtainable, but at the same time, there are constraints. You don't have all the money in the world to spend on implementing the intervention you don't have all the time in the world to implement it, and you have to worry about handing it off to community settings, clinic settings, and so on, school settings. So again, note the tension between effectiveness and the other three desiderata. And one of the important features of optimization is that, is that it acknowledges the reality that there are these constraints. And the framework here is to do the very best you can while acknowledging these constraints and coming up with realistic interventions. Here is a schematic of the multi-phase optimization strategy. And you see that there are these three blue boxes, each of which represents one of the three phases of the multi-phase optimization strategy. So it's called multi-phase because there are these three phases. The first phase is preparation in which the investigator lays the groundwork for optimization. And there are a number of activities there listed, listed below. We're going to go over those. The opt, in the optimization phase of most, the investigator builds the optimized intervention. Again, a number of activities that we're going to go over. And at that point, the investigator, after the intervention has been optimized, ascertains whether the optimized intervention is expected to be sufficiently effective and then, if it is, um, goes on to the evaluation phase. And in the evaluation phase, the, the optimized intervention is evaluated by means of a standard RCT. So we're going to talk some more about each of these three phases. So let's start with the preparation phase. As we said, the preparation phase uh, is the first phase, and its purpose is to lay the groundwork for optimization. So one important activity here is to review any prior research in the area, to take stock of whatever clinical experience the investigators may have, to conduct any secondary analyses that uh, would be helpful, and et cetera. Everything that you already do as an intervention scientist to 
lay the groundwork for developing an intervention is done right here in the preparation phase. Uh, the next step is to derive a very detailed conceptual model. The conceptual model is, is very similar to uh, a logic model. In, in fact, it is essentially a logic model, but more specific than the typical logic model because it involves specifying which intervention components target which proximal mediators. Based on this model, one selects intervention components to examine. Any pilot or feasibility work is done here. It's done before entering the optimization phase. It might be a good idea to stop for a moment and define what we mean by a pilot study because uh, the definition of that seems to vary across fields. But what we mean by, by pilot study is a more informal study or, or experiment that is designed just to check the feasibility or implementability uh, or, or potentially the initial cost of individual intervention components. A pilot study, according to our definition, is not sufficiently powered. It's a much more informal study than that, and you would never do hypothesis testing based on a pilot study. As you'll see, the optimization trials that are done in the optimization phase are fully powered, carefully controlled experiments, not pilot studies. Finally, the intervention scientist identifies a clearly operationalized optimization criterion. So let's take a moment to talk about that because that's um, perhaps a little bit unusual. So what is an optimization criterion? It's important to remember that you always need a clearly stated optimization criterion before you begin optimization. So you select it before you enter the optimization phase of most. The optimization criterion expresses the goal that you want to achieve. And once you achieve this goal, it sets a bar that then can be, we hope, exceeded in later efforts. So one possible optimization criterion is a very simple one. You don't have any specific key constraints, but you just don't want waste. So you want an efficient intervention that has no dead wood. We, we often call this the all active components optimization criterion. You don't have any specific constraints on cost because you're just going to select all the components that are moving the needle on the outcome. So consider a clinic-based smoking cessation intervention, for example. Maybe to reduce waste of time and money, you just want to be confident that every component is necessary. You don't have an upper limit on cost. You just want to be confident that every component is necessary. Well, you can achieve this by selecting only active intervention components. Now, how do you know which intervention components are active? I'm going to get to that soon, but just as a little preview, the optimization trial that you do during the optimization phase tells you this. It tells you which components are active. We're gonna get more specific about that when we, in a moment when we talk about the optimization phase. Another possible optimization criterion would be one where the key constraint is money. So maybe you want the most effective intervention you, you can uh, build that can be delivered for less than some upper limit on cost. So consider a clinic-based smoking cessation intervention. Maybe insurers have told you that they'll pay for a program that costs no more than $500 a person to implement, including all materials and staff time. What can you do with that? Well, you can select a set of components that represents the most effective intervention you can get based on the components you have on the table that can be delivered for no more than $500 a person. And again, the optimization trial gives you the information you need to make that selection. Another key constraint could be time. Maybe you're looking for the most effective intervention that can be delivered in less than or equal to some amount of time. Again, let's consider a clinic-based smoking cessation intervention. Maybe you've interviewed clinic staff, and they tell you that, that in their busy workload, they potentially could spend 90 minutes to deliver an intervention, but no more. So now that's your constraint. You want to select the set of components that represents the most effective intervention that can be delivered in less than or equal to 90 minutes. And, and once again, that optimization trial gives you the information you need to select the components. There's lots of other possibilities for optimization criteria. Cost effectiveness, you could use a criterion based on a combination of cost and time. 
if, if you could operationalize participant burden, you could use that as a constraint and develop the most effective intervention without exceeding a specified level of participant burden. That can be tricky because participant burden can be hard to operationalize, but if you can do it, then that might be a great um, optimization, that might make a great optimization criterion. Or you can use any other relevant criterion. There are lots and lots of possibilities, and if you're thinking of one, it probably would make a great optimization criterion. Okay, so let's move now to the optimization phase of most. The purpose of the optimization phase is to build the optimized intervention. We want to form a treatment package that meets the optimization criterion that was specified in the preparation phase. So we do this by collecting and analyzing empirical data on performance of individual intervention components, and we're going to rely on efficient randomized experiments. And then based on the information gathered, we'll select the components and component levels that meet the optimization criterion. And those components and component levels are going to form the treatment package. I know that seems a little uh, abstract right now, but we're going to get more concrete about it in the moment. And the final phase is evaluation. The objective here is to establish whether the optimized intervention has a statistically significant effect compared to a suitable control or alternative intervention, and that is established simply by conducting the familiar RCT. So here's a schematic of the multi-phase optimization strategy. Again, some we have some number of components that we want to use uh, possibly to form uh, an intervention, but notice that instead of going directly to formation of the intervention, we enter a phase of empirically based optimization. Based on that, we select some components that go into the intervention. And before, you might remember that I used a black box for the intervention because you don't really know what's going on inside an intervention if you um, construct it using the classical treatment package approach. But here, if you use most and you conduct an optimization trial, you know which components are, are working and which ones are not. You know which ones should go into the intervention. And once you've assembled the optimized intervention, it can be evaluated by means of an RCT. So empirically based optimization, formation of the intervention, and evaluation. I want to point out, uh, you can see those two red arrows, and I want to point out two fundamental principles of most. The continual optimization principle you see at the top there, and the resource management principle you see at the bottom. The resource management principle says that when conducting research in the optimization and evaluation phases, you need to make the best use of available resources. You have a certain budget to conduct experimentation, and you want to get as much scientific information as you can for each dollar in that budget. And the continual optimization principle says that you can't uh, necessarily just optimize an intervention once and be done, that most actually provides an opportunity to keep improving an intervention incrementally, to keep raising the bar. For example, maybe you establish that a particular set of components gives you the most effective intervention uh, you could find that you can bring in for less than $500 a person. So maybe you would want to optimize again to establish an intervention that is equally effective but costs only $400 a person. Or maybe you want to stick with that $500 a person budget and develop an even more effective intervention. So the continual optimization principle says that you, if you want to, you can optimize again and again and just keep raising that bar. So you're probably wondering at this point, how do you do this? I'm going to give you an example, and there, at this point there are many examples of applications of most. This one is a clinic-based smoking cessation study. The objective here is to develop a highly effective smoking cessation intervention that can be delivered for less than $500 a person. And the principal investigators are Mike Fiore and Tim Baker at the University of Wisconsin. And this study was funded by the National Cancer Institute. This shows you um, the Baker and, and Fiore phase-based model of the smoking cessation process. There is an initial motivation phase. Then uh, people move into pre-cessation, which is three weeks up to the quit day. And according to this, this model, everyone sets a specific quit date. Then after the quit date, so the cessation phase is, is from that quit date to two weeks after, and then there's a maintenance phase that's two weeks to six months after the quit date. 
The experiment that I'm going to show you, the optimization trial, is um, mainly concerns pre-cessation, cessation, and maintenance. Here are the six components. Now, you, you may have heard me use the expression candidate components. So candidate components are components that are candidates for inclusion in an intervention. So these are six candidate components. Pre-cessation use of a nicotine patch could be no or yes. Pre-cessation use of uh, ad-lib use of nicotine gum. Ad-lib just means people use it whenever they want to. No or yes. Now I want to stop for a moment. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the smoking cessation literature may be wondering, isn't nicotine replacement the standard of care in smoking cessation? It is, in fact, the standard of care, starting with the quit date. And in this experiment, in fact, every participant did get nicotine replacement starting at the quit date. What's different here is experimenting with using nicotine replacement before the quit date during the pre-cessation phase. The third candidate component is pre-cessation in-person counseling. Again, could be no or yes. Uh, fourth component is cessation. Now, this is, this is now after the quit date, during the cessation phase, in-person counseling. Now, notice that this is not no or yes, don't include, include. This is minimal or intensive, a lower level or a higher level. Cessation phone counseling, lower level. This is a schematic of most as implemented in the smoking cessation study I've been talking about. There are the six candidate components on the far left. Uh, we are examining these components in uh, an optimization trial, a particular type of optimization trial called a component screening experiment, uh, selecting the, uh, the components that meet the optimization criterion, uh, then uh, assembling them into a package, the optimized intervention that then is evaluated by means of an RCT. Okay, so how can we choose an efficient experimental design for the component, this component screening experiment? Well, um, there are, we're going to start by talking about three different possibilities that I think will be familiar to you. One is conducting six individual experiments, one on each component. Another is a comparative treatment experiment, which I'll explain in a moment. You've, you've heard of these before, you, possibly not by that name, but you're familiar with them. And the last is a factorial experiment. Okay, so the first design option, which I'll call option A, is conducting six kind of, kind of little RCTs, six treatment control experiments. So uh, patch versus no patch would be the first one, gum versus no gum would be the second one, and so on. So in each of those, just a simple uh, two condition experiment uh, where um, the component in question is turned on and then there's, it's compared to a control group. So that would require an N of just over 3000 to power it uh, at a, a power of 0.8 or greater. And uh, there would be 12 experimental conditions and it's not possible to look at interactions between components in, in that kind of a design. This, the second option, which I'll call option B, is the comparative treatment experiment. So in this experiment, there would be seven experimental conditions. You see there's one control group, and then there are these six treatment conditions. Um, in the first condition, the one that's the farthest to the left, uh, there's, uh, the, the, the patch would be set to yes or on, and all the others would be set to low or no. Um, and then in the second condition, gum would be set to yes or on, and all the others would be set to low or no, and so on. So um, there are, there's essentially six treatment conditions here and one shared control condition. This is usually called a comparative treatment experiment. There are similar kinds of experiments called dismantling experiments, um, and uh, they, go, they go by other names. This one would require an N of about 1,800, and uh, would require seven experimental conditions to be implemented, and uh, there would be no uh, interactions again that could be estimated. So the third option is a factorial experiment, two to the sixth, and by that I mean it's a two by two by two by two by two by two. Um, I say that right, I think, <laughs> experiment, experiment. And that would be 64 experimental conditions. Now, Notice that, that the factorial experiment would require only 512 subjects. Now that may surprise some of you because uh, for people who are trained primarily in, who have been trained primarily in the RCT, it's kind of hard to wrap your mind around the idea that a factorial experiment makes uh, very efficient use of experimental subjects, but 
it actually does. That This is why factorial experiments were originally invented, in fact, in, in agricultural settings. And I'm going to explain this in a moment. It actually uh, is not difficult to see why factorial experiments make, make such efficient use of subjects. Of course, the downside is that 64 experimental conditions would be required. We're going to come back to that. And you can look at all interactions. All of, any, any possible interaction up to the six-way interaction could be examined in this design. So let's uh, take a moment to review factorial experiments 101 because uh, some of you may uh, be a little rusty on factorial experiments. So the, the classic factorial experiment is just the simple two by two factorial design. If you had two components, uh, each, each would could represent a factor in the experiment and there would be four experimental conditions, one where they're both set to off or low, one where they're both set to on, and then a condition where A is off and B is on and a condition where uh, a is on and B is off. So uh, this would be just the simple two by two factorial design. Of course, factorial experiments can have um, more than two factors, and we're going to be examining factorial experiments in a moment that have more than two factors. They also can have um, more than two levels per factor. In this presentation, I'm going to stick to factorial experiments that have only two levels per factor. There's a good reason for that, which we can talk about during the discussion if you're interested. So on the next slide is a two to the fourth, a two by two by two by two factorial design. So this would have these 16 experimental conditions. You see that there are just four factors. I call them factor A, B, C, and D. And uh, in this case, in this sort of generic experiment, they can, uh, each factor can be either off or on. And in the first column for factor A, you see that in conditions one through eight, factor A is set to off, and conditions nine through 16, factor A is set to on, and so on. You can see that uh, across the board. And in the first experimental, experimental condition, all the factors are off. In condition eight, for example, factor A is off, and factors B, C, and D are on, and, and so on. So that's the complete set of 16 experimental conditions. Now, why am I showing you this? showing you this for a couple reasons. One, in case you've never seen a large factorial experiment before, it's a good idea to get a sense of, of how you make up the experimental conditions in a factorial experiment. That's one reason. But the main reason is I want to use this to show you why it is that factorial experiments make such efficient use of experimental subjects. But first, let's take a look at what we're trying to estimate in a factorial experiment. We're trying to estimate two quantities, main effects and interactions. Concept of a main effect is very simple, and the main effect is extremely important in selecting components when you're making up an optimized intervention. So the main effect of, say, factor A is the effect of factor A averaged across all the levels of all the other factors. It's the effect of factor A averaged across all the levels of all the other factors. Now notice that this is different from the effect of, of factor A or the effect of the first component that you'd be estimating in say a comparative treatment experiment. In that comparative treatment experiment, you'd be estimating the effect of the first component, say the use of the nicotine patch, with all of the other components set to a particular level, all, all, of, the, all of the other components set to the low level. Here in a factorial experiment, if let's say factor A corresponded to the nicotine patch, you'd be looking at the effect of the nicotine patch averaged across the levels of the five other factors. You also are interested in estimating interactions in a factorial experiment. Now the way to think of interactions is like this. Think of, a, think of an interaction between two factors, factor A and factor B. If the effect of factor A is the same no matter which level of factor B you're looking at, factor A and factor B do not interact. If the effect of factor A is different depending on which level of factor B you're looking at, then factor A and factor B do interact. Okay, now why do I say that, and why did I demonstrate a few minutes ago, that factorial experiments make such efficient use of experimental subjects? Look at this table. It shows how we estimate the main effect of factor A. Remember I said that the main effect of factor A is the effect of factor A averaged across the levels of all the other factors. 
So the main effect of factor A is going to be the effect, is going to be the average of conditions one through eight compared to the average of conditions nine through 16. Okay, so keep that in mind and notice that all of the experimental subjects, all the subjects in one through eight and all the subjects in nine through 16, all of their data is used in this main effect estimate. Now, let's look at what gives us the main effect of factor B. The main effect of factor B is going to be obtained by looking at the mean of conditions one through four and nine through 12 versus the mean of conditions five through eight and 13 through 16. All the subjects are involved in this main effect as well. They're just rearranged. The main effect of factor C, again, all the subjects are used. This is gonna be one, two, five, six, nine, 10, 13, and 14 versus three, four, seven, eight, 11, 12, and 15, and 16. And you can probably guess how we get the main effect of factor D. It's gonna be the even numbered conditions versus the odd numbered conditions. And again, all of the experimental subjects are involved. It's easiest to show this with main effects, but it's the same for interactions. All of the subjects are involved in the estimation of all of the effects in a properly conducted and analyzed factorial, balanced factorial experiment. So this is why factorial experiments make such efficient use of experimental subjects. So a few facts, interesting facts about factorial experiments. When used to address suitable research questions, balanced factorial experimental designs often require many fewer subjects than alternative designs. And as I showed you in that table a few minutes ago, certainly requires many fewer subjects than conducting an individual experiment on each component you wanna test. It's often possible to add one or more factors to a factorial experiment and maintain the same level of power without any increase in the number of subjects. And we can talk about that some more if you're interested. And when effect coding that is minus one, one coding is used to analyze data from a balanced factorial experiment, all effect estimates are uncorrelated. You may be more accustomed to dummy coding, which uses zeros and ones. Um, effect coding is a different way to analyze data from a factorial experiment. It's, it's actually the standard way, I would say, to analyze data from a factorial experiment because if you use effect coding, the effect estimates you get correspond to uh, the definitions in textbooks. If you use dummy coding, they don't. Uh, the effect estimates you get do not necessarily correspond to, to the definitions you see in, in stat textbooks. So when effect coding is used, all effect estimates are uncorrelated. That has some important advantages. Now there's another design option that I did not show you previously. I'm gonna call it design option D. It's a fractional factorial experiment. We don't have much time to get into this, but I wanted to mention it because it actually is the experimental design that was selected in the smoking cessation study that I'm using as an example. This is a special type of factorial experiment, fractional factorial experiments, where you don't run all of the experimental conditions. Instead, you run a specially selected subset of experimental conditions. And, and the term specially selected is really important here. It's, you don't just select any subset. It's a carefully uh, selected subset, and it's selected using statistical criteria. So you don't look at a list and pick, pick the conditions you think are interesting totally based on statistical criteria. Fractional factorial designs use fewer experimental conditions, but the same number of subjects, the same number of subjects. So you're eliminating experimental conditions, which can be more economical because, uh, it's, because there's less, uh, fewer logistical complications, but there's no savings in terms of subjects. Fractional factorial uh, designs require at most half the experimental conditions of a complete factorial, sometimes fewer than that. But they require some important assumptions and important trade-offs that we don't have time to get into here. But I do wanna make you aware of these kinds of designs. So in the Wisconsin study, in the smoking cessation study, we actually selected a fractional factorial experiment that required 512 uh, subjects, but only 32 experimental conditions. Now, in a fractional factorial design, you can look at some interactions, but not all of them. If you're interested in more about that, this optimization trial, you can uh, take a look at this uh, publication in Addiction that describes it in detail. So how do you use data from an, exper an experiment like this one to optimize? Well, you 
Of course, conduct the experiment, then you conduct an analysis of variance on the data, and you obtain estimates of the effects of each of the components, the main effects, and whether they interact with any uh, of the other components. You use this information to select components. You discard components that do not perform adequately. Now you, as the investigator, you get to select uh, what performing adequately means. Maybe it's having a significant effect on the outcome. Maybe it's having an effect of a particular effect size. There's a lot of different ways to define what adequately means. You can use the size of the effects in combination with other data, for example, data on cost, uh, to select components that will make up uh, the optimized intervention. And uh, there are guidelines for doing this. Uh, there's a lot of different approaches and developing ways of doing this as an active research area, but there is a publication on, on this uh, that appeared a few years ago in uh, the journal Translational Behavioral Medicine. Okay, a few frequently asked questions. Nice idea, but will it be fundable? I get that question a lot, and it's quite understandable. In the United States, the National Institutes of Health has funded more than 20 studies using most in one form or another, and funders have included uh, NCI, uh, NIDA, NHLBI, NIAAA, NIDDK, NIMH, NICHD, uh, NIMHHD, and this is, of course, not, a, not part of NIH, but the U USDA, the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we have um, uh, uh, part of our website where we list uh, funding opportunities, and the, the URL is, is there. We encourage you to, to take a look at that. I'm going to go over just quickly some of these uh, projects to give you a sense of the funding mechanisms that have been used in the areas of research. There's a study on uh, prevention of drug abuse and HIV in South Africa. The PI is my colleague at Penn State, Linda Caldwell. There's a substance use prevent, some of these have been completed. There's a substance use prevention program aimed at American Indian families, Nancy Whitesell at the University of Colorado. Moderation of gestational weight gain, Danielle Downs here at Penn State. Uh, this is one that uh, I'm one of the PIs on in, in a multiple PI arrangement, an intervention to get HIV positive individuals into the healthcare system and on antiretroviral therapy. Maria Guads is the PI of record at NYU. Weight reduction, a weight reduction program for adults, Bonnie Spring and I are, are working on that. An online intervention to prevent excessive alcohol use and risky sex in college students, I'm the PI on that. It's taking place here at Penn State and also at UNC Greensboro. A positive psychology intervention for cardiac patients to improve health behaviors, Jeff Huffman at Harvard. A tobacco treatment for smokers getting lung cancer screening, Jamie Ostroff at Sloan Kettering in New York City. Tobacco dependence treatment in the emergency department, Steve Bernstein, who's an emergency room doc at Yale, is conducting that study. Uh, optimizing text messaging to improve adherence to mm -hmm. online cessation treatment, Dr. Graham at the Truth Initiative Foundation. A remotely delivered cessation for low-income smokers, Danielle McCarthy, currently at the University of Wisconsin. A text messaging-based weight loss study, Gary Bennett at Duke University. And there's a number of K awards, uh, physical activity for breast cancer survivors, Siobhan Phillips at Northwestern. Diet intervention in type 2 diabetes at the University of Michigan. Smoking cessation intervention for homeless youth at Ohio State. An adherence intervention to promote the use of insulin pumps among uh, diabetic adolescents at U the University of Florida, and maternal depression care seeking at UC Davis. These are all K awards. And other mechanisms in R21, an intervention to reduce the fear of recurrence in breast cancer patients, an intervention to prevent childhood obesity. This is the USDA funded one by Lori Francis here at Penn State. Self regulation to promote health behaviors in children at the University of Michigan, community-based uh, multi-level intervention to reduce alcohol use and illegal drug use at the University of Illinois. That's a U, the U mechanism. An engineering, uh, engineering effective interventions for tobacco use, a translational laboratory. I was uh, involved in this study. Mike Fiore at the University of Wisconsin was the PI. Uh, and uh, this is a, the next one is a currently funded study, Optimized Chronic Care for Smokers, a Comparative Effectiveness Approach. It's a program project funded by NCI. So I think that demonstrates that uh, NIH is interested in uh, 
funding this type of research? Can this approach be carried out with a level of funding and amount of time typically available? Well, yes, because um, you know, we, we've seen evidence of that in all of these other funded studies. Um, not every uh, study can be, uh, not, not every study can carry out all three phases of most within one five-year period though. And you also may find that you are reallocating resources, using resources in a, in a different way. Some people say that they don't see how they can implement all the experimental conditions required by a factorial experiment. And I know that that can seem daunting if you're accustomed to the two-arm or three-arm RCT, but I have a list here of, of published articles that uh, relate successful implementations of uh, factorial experiments ranging from 16 to 32 experimental conditions. So it, it definitely can be done. And we can talk a little bit about uh, some tips for doing that if, if you like. So I just would like to conclude by asking you to imagine a world in which the active ingredients of every intervention are known, where it's possible to optimize an intervention to suit different circumstances. So um, we may have the results of an optimization trial that tells us what the effect of each component is. And you may be in a situation where you can spend $500 a person and I may be in a situation where I can only spend $300 a person. And we can use the results of the optimization trial to optimize uh, different interventions that would probably have uh, somewhat different components. Imagine that interventions are immediately scalable that interventions are optimized to be able to be implemented properly within certain constraints so that there's no need for ad hoc modifications when interventions go to scale. And that every new intervention that's developed is demonstrably and incrementally better than what came before. I think all of these things are possible using the multi-phase optimization strategy. And in particular, I love the idea of intervention science developing a coherent base of knowledge about what works. Once we know which components work and which components interact with each other, I think we'll, we will go a long way toward developing a coherent base of knowledge that can be built upon so that certain components don't have, no, certain components no longer have to be experimented on in, in uh, the development of every new intervention. If you're interested in more information about the multi-phase optimization strategy, I encourage you to look at our website, methodology.psu.edu, and of course, uh, it's just not my work that's featured on there. It's the work of my amazing colleagues at the Methodology Center. There's a lot of very interesting stuff on there. I encourage uh, you to sign up for our e-news, which only comes out about nine or ten times a year, so it won't clutter up your inbox too much, but we announce uh, trainings that we do, which you might be interested in. There's a special section on most, uh, as there is on uh, various research areas within the center, that has uh, suggested reading and FAQ and advice for people writing grant proposals involving most. I did a, a very short TED talk a few years ago that you can take a look at. Uh, there are going to be two books on most uh, published in 2018. Uh, I, I've written a book on most that's a comprehensive introduction to it. And that is, I just, just learned a few days ago, is uh, expected to come out in January. The publisher is Springer. And I'm also working on another edited book with a, a collaborator, Carrie Kugler, and that one will come out uh, more toward the middle of, of 2018. And that, that covers a number of advanced topics um, written by experts in those respective areas. You might be interested in a five-day workshop on most that is sponsored by, jointly sponsored by the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research uh, at NIH and uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse. It will be May 14th to 18th. Uh, in 2018 uh, in a, at a hotel in Bethesda, Maryland. The application window for that will be open December 15th. And for information on that, uh, you can sign up for our e-news, you can watch our website, or if you would like to text uh, Aaron your email address, we will send you an announcement to let you know that the, the, that window is open. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for hanging in there with our little technical difficulties today. And I'm looking forward to addressing uh, any questions you may have. So we had some questions about the idea of independence. So uh, uh, okay. the first one was, do components need to be independent of each other? Depends on what you mean by independent, but, but basically, yes. They, they, have to be, uh, they have to be able to be implemented independently. Because when you conduct a factorial experiment, 
uh, there's going to be, you know, let's say you have three components and we'll call them A, B, and C. Uh, there's going to, so if, if you conduct a two to the third factorial experiment, there's going to be um, a condition where, where A is implemented without B and C and B is, 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 is implemented without A and C and so on. So yes, they have to be able to be implemented independently. It doesn't mean that they uh, necessarily, um, well, they, they certainly can be af affecting the same mediators. So they're not, in, they don't have to be independent in that sense. They have to be operationally independent. Maybe that would be the way to put it. Okay. And um, a similar question, but different enough that I yeah. think I'll ask it also. Um, uh, this person said, I'm wondering if consideration of a series exists in this process. For example, if you have one thing that has to come before uh -huh. another, even if the most quote unquote bang for your buck comes from component two, you have to do uh -huh. component, component one in order for component two to have that effect. Yeah, that is actually very common um, in intervention science. And there's a couple different um, ways to handle that. I'll give you an example of one way. Uh, in uh, drug abuse prevention, which is a field I, I, I've worked in a little bit, um, it's very often felt that there's, there's some basic information that kids have to be given. So they need to be given basic information about what drugs are and the effect of drugs on the brain and the psyche and so on. Um, so you can have what I call, and this is explained in, uh, a bit in my book, a constant component. And so that is a, a part of the intervention that everybody gets. And then you manipulate the other components in addition to that. So for example, in, in well, to make it clearer, if you think of that, um, let me uh, back up here and go back to that slide that had the um, two to the fourth, here we go. So imagine you were implementing this experiment, but there would be kind of another column in there where everyone, where, and it was just, it would be on all the way down, and everybody would get that information, that the informational component. So we sometimes call that uh, a knowledge or, or, uh, or core. Some people call it a core component. I usually call it a constant component because it's a constant in the experiment. So that's one way to handle it. If you have two components that you want to experiment on, A and B, uh, uh, this is kind of an, al an alternative scenario, and you and in order for um, B to be implemented, you need A, but to implement A, you don't need B, <laughs> and so you're wondering, do you need uh, A and B, or or would just A do? In a case like that, I think the way to handle that is to make the two levels of the factor A and A plus B rather than have two separate factors. That's usually what I, what I recommend. You know, it, uh, it's a little bit hard sometimes to talk about experimental design in the abstract because uh, you really need to be talking with people about what their specific research questions are. So if neither one of those uh, suits what you want to do, there's probably another alternative. Okay. Sorry, I'm trying to gather the questions as I ask oh, them. That's so okay. Sometimes I'm a little back and forth here. Yeah. Okay. Um, Next question is, I think going to be a tricky one, but uh, what data and methods are used to test the components? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that was probably a little bit abstract, um, but I'll give you uh, uh, the, an example from the smoking cessation study. Um, the outcome on that, well, the outcome on that one was just simply had people quit smoking. So that's sometimes called point prevalence abstinence in the smoking cessation literature. Um, and you, you analyze the data using uh, a generalized linear models um, approach. So it's basically a large regression model that has uh, all of the effects in it for the analysis of variance. So you have uh, 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 vectors, and this, this is um, explained in my book, although um, 
uh, I'm beginning to see maybe the need for some additional uh, literature on exactly how you conduct um, uh, analyses of, of uh, large data from large factorial experiments. But anyway, um, you would have a, a vector corresponding, so there'd be a vector for each of the main effects and a vector for each interaction in, in the model. And those are on the X side, so those are the predictors. And then you uh, run a regression and uh, it would be uh, a logistic regression or a Poisson regression or something like that if, if the outcome is not a normally distributed variable. So it's the same basic idea as other analyses, other analyses that you've done. You just probably have um, more predictors on, on the X side than you're accustomed to. But um, I want to point out that in a balanced, in a perfectly balanced factorial experiment, which means that you have the right experimental conditions and you have perfectly equal ends, um, the uh, effect estimates will all be uncorrelated. Now, you're probably all thinking, well, I would never have perfectly equal ends. And of course, in field studies, you never have perfectly equal ends. But the correlations uh, among the effects will be small unless you have um, huge, hugely unequal ends. So that's the basics of how you conduct uh, those kinds of analyses. It's, it's um, not anything different from uh, what you've already done. Thanks. Um, question about smart and adaptive designs. Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Can Linda briefly explain the difference between most and smart or mm -hmm. how they are related? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm really glad you asked yeah, that, I was, that I, question. That, that's, that's a great, question, that's a great that, uh, question. We would have written ourselves yeah, if we were that's writing right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we didn't think of that one. So, um, so the first thing I want to point out is that, this, so first of all, for people who don't know, SMART stands for the Sequential Multiple Assignment Randomized Trial. And that's an experimental design that was, that's been pioneered by uh, my friend and collaborator, Susan Murphy, and uh, also has been advanced more recently by my also friends and collaborators, um, Daniel Almiral and Billy Namshani. Um, and that is, I want to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to um, be correcting the person who asked this question, and forgive me for being a little obnoxious here, but uh, the SMART is not an adaptive research design. It's not an adaptive experimental design. However, it is an experimental design that is used for optimization of adaptive interventions. So adaptive interventions are interventions in which um, people don't necessarily get the same um, components or component levels. Instead, um, uh, their, uh, a measurement is taken of their progress over time, usually, that can be done in different ways. And depending on their progress, uh, the intervention might be stepped up or stepped down, or they might get a different intervention component altogether, or some other strategy might be used. Uh, and these, these uh, kinds of interventions are, uh, are very, very useful, and people are um, really interested in, in developing them. So the sequential multiple assignment randomized trial is one way that you can optimize interventions. So I'm going to go back to uh, one of the schematics that shows, gives an overview. Uh, here we go, an overview of most. And if you look inside that box, the box that says optimization, you see that one of the activities is, is conducting one or more optimization trials. And there's a list of the different, different so, some different kinds, I won't say the different, different kinds because there's lots of different ways you can conduct optimization trials. And I, I wanna hold open the possibility that there's some that we haven't thought of yet. I, I hope that's true. But um, you see that fact, factorial experiment, fractional factorial experiment, which we talked about today, SMART trial is listed there, micro-randomized trial, which is uh, uh, something new that Susan Murphy is working on, system identification experiment, and you know, as I said, there, there may be other possibilities. So most is an overall framework. This is how most and SMART fit together. Most is a general framework for optimization of behavioral and biobehavioral and biomedical interventions. And within that framework, when you get to the optimization phase, there's a lot of different approaches you can use to conduct an optimization trial. And how do you select um, the, the approach to an optimization trial? Well, it's a little bit outside the, uh, what we can talk about today, but essentially it's gonna be determined by what's the most efficient 
So what best, best follows the resource management principle and what answers the research questions you're asking for a particular type of intervention. So if it's a fixed intervention, you're typically going to want, and by fixed I mean everybody gets the same components at the same dosage levels. And a lot of, most interventions today are still like that, the traditional fixed intervention. It's probably going to be a factorial or fractional factorial experiment. So the traditional factorial or fractional factorial experiment. Now, let's turn to adaptive interventions. Adaptive interventions can vary in the intensity of adaptation. So highly intensive adaptive interventions are interventions where adaptation occurs frequently or occurs many times. So an example of uh, a high-intensity uh, high adaptive intervention is, a, is the just-in-time adaptive intervention. This is a new area that, that is receiving a lot of attention where, for example, you carry around a smartphone and it keeps track of whether you're engaging in sufficient physical activity and if you're being a couch potato on a particular day, it sends you a message saying, hey, get up and, and walk around. So that, uh, that intervention is monitoring you all day and it could send you several of those notices in, in the course of a day. That, that's one example of a high intensity adaptive intervention. A, a, a lower intensity adaptive intervention would be, let's say, an intervention for um, someone who's being treated for drug addiction or alcoholism. And uh, after two weeks in treatment, they come in and their progress is assessed. And if they're doing really well on the intervention, they might be given, they might be switched to a lighter touch intervention. If they are still engaging in substance abuse, then the intervention might be stepped up at, at that point. So that's something where every two weeks or every four weeks there might be an adaptation. So that's a much lower intensity adaptive intervention. For lower intensity adaptive interventions, typically a SMART trial is a great option. For higher intensity interventions, the micro-randomized trial is, is one possibility. Um, and the factorial experiment, the fractional factorial experiment, the SMART and the micro-randomized trial are all, all fit in the family of the factorial experiment. It might not be immediately obvious to, to you, uh, perhaps, um, how that works, but they are all special cases of the, of the, fact, the, the broader factorial experiment. System identification is a whole other thing. Um, with you, you would do a system identification experiment if you're taking an engineering control approach. You can actually um, use uh, principles from control engineering to develop a controller for uh, an adaptive intervention. There's going to be a chapter on that, I hope, in the uh, ed in the book that I'm editing. So the first several on that list are all kind of in one general category. System identification is, is something that's really uh, qualitatively different from the others. But I hope that's, that's maybe more than you wanted to know, but I hope it answered your, your question about how the sequential multiple assignment randomized trial fits in with, into the broader most framework. Yeah, and as we um, go through these questions, if you have any follow-ups or if you something you didn't understand about Lin, Linda's answer, uh, yeah. Please, uh, Please do, let us yeah. know. I'd yeah. be happy to go over something again yeah. or explain right. it a different way. Um, question about grant writing. Oh, yes. Uh, how have you planned the different phases of grants with most? Mm. Do you do the preparation with an R21, optimization with an R01, and another R01 for the RCT, mm -hmm. or is there a faster way? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, that, that, that's another really great question. Typically, I think you need to have the preparation phase done before at, le at least – at least the part where you've developed a conceptual model, that I think should be done before you write a grant proposal because it makes a much stronger grant proposal. Um, how much you can fit into one three-year or five-year cycle depends on several factors that are specific to your research area. One of them is just how long it takes to implement the intervention. Um, you know, some interventions take weeks or months to deliver. Other interventions are, are delivered in 15 minutes or an hour or something like that. So that's one limiting factor. Another limiting factor is how long it takes before 
you can expect to see an impact. So for example, if you're intervening on cardiovascular risk, even if it's people who have already had a heart attack, you're gonna to have to wait a fairly long period of time uh, before you can tell whether your intervention has reduced cardiovascular risk. Um, if it's an intervention like uh, the one we're working on, an, an online intervention to um, uh, reduce excessive alcohol use in risky sex in college students, that can be evaluated within a few months. So that's, a, that's another limiting factor. A third limiting factor is the practicalities of how long it takes you to recruit subjects. Sometimes, uh, well, for example, uh, in my project with Bonnie Spring at Northwestern, we had to recruit subjects uh, on the mass transportation system in the Chicago area, and they just you know, contacted us when they were interested in taking part uh, in the study. So we recruited people, but we basically had to wait for them to walk in the door. So subjects kind of, if it's a clinic setting or that kind of a setting, subjects kind of trickle in and uh, you can only go so far to increase the pipeline there. By contrast, in the study I'm doing that's funded by NIAAA to develop an intervention aimed at college students, every fall we get uh, a new uh, a new crop of freshmen that's aimed at freshmen. So that's a case where we get a lot of subjects all at once. And then we don't have the opportunity to get any more really until the next fall. So there's all different, <coughs> excuse me, all different possibilities for uh, how quickly you can recruit subjects. So those are all limiting factors. Um, I have, in, in the various studies that I have had funded, most of them uh, have been uh, R01s or similar where the preparation phase has been done. So we've developed a conceptual model in advance uh, and done any pilot testing and, or at least done some minimal pilot testing and have identified uh, an optimization criteria. And I think most of you know, you're always in a stronger position if you've got a well-identified conceptual model and you've done pilot testing before you propose a, a study to NIH. Then they varied in whether they propose both the optimization phase and the evaluation phase or just the optimization phase. Um, the majority of my studies have proposed just the optimization phase, but I have had one or two that, that have where we've been able to propose both optimization and evaluation. That's very, very uh, dependent on ex the exact situation and the circumstances that I, I talked about before, how long it takes to implement, um, how long uh, it takes to get subjects, that, that, that sort of thing, how long it takes to evaluate. Yeah, but that, yeah, it is one of the concerns. Yes, yeah, so, right? yeah, yeah. of course, of course it's one of the concerns, yeah. So. Um, about the design used in the smoking cessation study, mm -hmm. Dr. Collins mentioned that there are statistical steps that are needed to make the decision about what comparisons to make. What are these methods? I'd imagine that in the case of smoking cessation, there are already existing statistics to help make the decision. But what about in the case where you're studying a new treatment? Mm -hmm. So I was talking there about a fractional factorial design. That was option D a fractional factorial design. And whoever asked this question, if this doesn't answer your question, um, please please email Aaron. But um, so what I, what I, or I'm sorry, I'm not, not email, it's, it's sent, message, mess, yeah. message, Aaron. <laughs> yeah. um, so what I was uh, trying to convey there is that in a, in a fractional factorial design, you have to select the subset of experimental conditions that you're going to um, be implementing. And that has, been, um, that has been worked out statistically. And the way, the way that works is um, you, have to be able, you have to be able and willing to assume that the higher order interactions, and by that I mean the interactions involving many factors, like three, uh, you don't necessarily have to assume that all of the three-way interactions are, are negligible, but certainly all the four-way, five-way, six-way interactions are, are negligible in size. And by negligible in size, I don't mean zero exactly, but they have to be small enough not to disrupt decision-making later. So they have to be pretty small. They have to be small enough so that 
Well, they have to be small enough not to disrupt decision making. Why do they have to be small? Because once you start pulling experimental conditions out of an experimental design, and I hope this, I hope this won't get too technical for, for people, but once you start pulling experimental conditions out of a factorial experiment, some effects become combined with other effects. Now that sounds scary, but for every possible fractional factorial design, it is known which effects are going to be combined with which other effects. So you can select a fractional factorial design that has where, where the effects that are combined are acceptable to you. Here's an example. In the Wisconsin project, that smoking cessation project, uh, the main effects were aliased with, uh, I believe it was five-way interactions. And so reviewers did not complain about that because we felt comfortable assuming that those five-way interactions were negligible in size. It's not a big deal to combine a main effect with an interaction when you feel comfortable assuming that the interaction is negligible in size. Now, some of you may think, oh my God, I would never want to do that. And if that's how you feel, then, then don't do it. But keep in mind that what you buy with that combining of effects is a lot of efficiency. Um, in, in that smoking cessation study, we would have had to have implemented 64 experimental conditions. Instead, we had to implement, implement only 32 experimental conditions. We were able to cut the number of conditions in half and, and save all the extra money that would have been, would have been associated with um, implementing all those other conditions. Just want to remind everybody, the sample size requirements were identical. It was just a reduction in the number of experimental conditions. But it seemed worth it to us, and we're, we're so glad we did it. So uh, in my book, there's a chapter on fractional factorial designs. And if you're interested in an, in an introduction to fractional factorial designs, you can look at an article that appeared in Psychological Methods in 2009. It's, it's uh, Collins, Ziak, D-Z-I-A-K, and Lee, L-I. It's kind of an, a primer on fractional factorial designs. I'm not uh, trying to sell fractional factorial designs uh, necessarily, but I do think that they merit consideration alongside other, other design possibilities. They're used routinely in engineering, they're, but they're not used very much in the behavioral sciences. And I, um, I, think they, I don't think they're always the right thing to do by any means, um, but no one experimental design is always the right thing to do. As I said, I think they merit consideration alongside other designs. Um, another question, is there any way to combine this approach with a stepped care model? The stepped care model is a type of adaptive intervention. So absolutely, if you're interested in optimizing an adaptive intervention, then you would want, uh, like, like a stepped care intervention, then you would probably want to use a SMART trial in the optimization phase. If you're interested in that, uh, in in um, optimization of adaptive interventions, there's an article, uh, Collins, uh, Almiral, and Naam Shani that appeared in, in the journal Clinical Trials. Um, I think it was 2013, uh, but you can look at the uh, suggested readings on, our, on the website, and that will uh, tell you what year it was. Mm -hmm. um, clarifying question. So components cannot be fidelity measures, but must be, quote, features leading to improved fidelity measures. Is that right? Well, uh, um, a component is something that you can manipulate experimentally. So if you're um, just measuring fidelity, for example, I mean, that's great, and you, and you probably want, you do want to measure fidelity. Um, but I'm talking here about uh, components because we're leading up to manipulating components experimentally uh, in the optimization phase. So a component, uh, I mean, a fidelity could be some, could, certainly could be something you measure, it could be an outcome, um, but fidelity components are a feature uh, 
uh, it's something that you're doing to try to improve fidelity. Maybe that would be one way to put it. Did that, did that answer the question? Do you think? Uh, I, I think so. Okay. Yeah. And if, if we're wrong, then yeah, please, let us know. Yeah, yeah. please do. Um, what are the primary assumptions that you make when conducting a fractional factorial experiment? You kind of went over this already in the questions that, that this question was asked before you answered this one time before, but then, and then yeah. when can you choose fractional factorial experiments over a factorial experiment? Ah, okay. Yeah. So uh, the main assumption you make uh, aside from, you know, the other kinds of assumptions you make with a, with a factorial experiment, the additional assumption you make with a fractional factorial experiment, as I said before, is that the higher order interactions are negligible uh, in size. And this is because uh, you're going to be combining, strategically, you're going to be combining lower order effects, which are the effects of primary scientific interest, with these higher order effects. And again, one other thing I should say is that if a higher order effect for some reason is of primary scientific interest to you, then you should not be using a fractional factorial design. But, but uh, those higher order effects are not of primary scientific, to, scientific interest to most people. And most people don't have any reason for thinking that a particular uh, higher order effect is going to be large. I should uh, say though, as a caveat, that we as intervention scientists know almost nothing about interactions among components, right? Because we've never done the kind of experimentation that would be, uh, would be required to give us that information. So there, there is that important caveat. But anyway, so that's, that's uh, the type of assumption you need to make. Now, when would you want to select a uh, factorial over a fractional factorial experiment? There's only one reason to consider a fractional factorial experiment, and that is, that is economy. If you have the resources to conduct a factorial experiment, then you would probably lean toward a factorial experiment. Very often, what it comes down to is you know you have the resources to manage a certain number, maximum number of experimental conditions. So let's say, let's say you know that you have the resources to conduct 16 experimental conditions. Well, you could examine four components in a two to the fourth factorial experiment, or you could examine five components in uh, a, fa a fractional factorial experiment. So the question is, which one do you want to do? Um, there's a sense in which a complete factorial would be safer, but there's an opportunity cost there because you don't get to look at whatever that fifth component would be. If you choose a fractional factorial design, you get to look at that fifth component, so you're getting additional scientific information, which is great, but if your assumptions about those higher order interactions are incorrect, then it potentially could lead you to make incorrect decisions. In the first scenario, you don't even get to make a decision about the fifth component that you're not gonna be able to look at. In the fractional factorial scenario, you get to look at five components, but there is uh, a potential risk of making incorrect decisions. So it's just uh, something that you, that you have to weigh. When do I recommend considering fractional factorial experiments? When the um, expenses associated with implementation of additional experimental conditions are high. Now again, I just wanna, I wanna remind you because it's very counterintuitive for people who've been trained in the RCT to remember that if you cut the number of experimental conditions in half by using a fractional factorial experiment, experimental design, you're not doing anything about the required sample size. The required, the required sample size stays identical. So I think the way to think of this is, what would be the incremental cost of adding an experimental condition but keeping the number of subjects exactly the same? So think about that. If that incremental cost is high, then you might want to consider conducting a fractional factorial design. An a perfect example of where that cost is typically not high and where I usually don't recommend that people consider a fractional factorial is any kind of online delivered intervention because there the experiment is going to be pretty much a matter of uh, computer programming. And once it's programmed, it's done and it, it pretty much administers itself. So in that case, I would just recommend conducting a, a complete factorial. Even if you have you know, 64 experimental conditions there, once it's programmed, it's going to be manageable. 
Now, in a complete factorial, as compared to a fractional factorial, you're going to have fewer subjects per condition, which also might seem weird to you. Fewer subjects per condition because you have more experimental conditions. Remember, again, complete factorials and fractional factorials require exactly the same sample size. So when you're dividing them up among conditions, you have fewer conditions in a fractional factorial. So the number of uh, subjects per condition is going to be larger in a fractional factorial as opposed to a complete factorial. That might seem weird to you, but again, you have the same power. And the reason is in um, any factorial experiment, Power is, is not determined by the per condition sample size. It's determined by the sample size per level of a factor. Very different from the RCT in that respect. So this was kind of an interesting question. Do you have any examples of where the most approach has led to the termination of an intervention before it reached the evaluation stage? Not yet. Um, in uh, one of my projects where we just are starting to analyze the data that may happen because it's looking like only one of the components uh, had an effect. But um, I'm not ready to, to speak publicly about that yet because we're still in the, uh, we're still in the optimization phase conducting uh, analyses on the data. We just, just recently finished. So no, not yet. But I will say that I wish NIH had um, kind of a provision for uh, if it's a if it's a study where the proposal um, called for both optimization and evaluation, if it would be possible to have kind of a branching point where that um, dot, that brown diamond is in, in the figure that is uh, up on the screen at the moment, and where you know, perhaps in in perhaps in consultation with the project officer. And, and uh, an experimenter could say, look, um, at this point, it doesn't make sense to do an evaluation. We should go back and conduct another optimization trial because we didn't end up with enough, enough components um, to, 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 to make a, an intervention that would, that would be sufficiently effective. Think of how many fewer failed RCTs there would be if that was a possibility. Just going back and following the arrow I have here, see where it says no, you follow the arrow down that says the resource management principle. Because the resource, man the resource management principle says here, don't do an evaluation. Don't waste the money on an RCT if, the, if you're pretty sure there's not, you don't have a shot at uh, developing an intervention that's gonna have a statistically and clinically significant effect. Instead, go back to the preparation phase, revisit your conceptual model, identify a new set or, or a new partial set of candidate components. You, you might have had a, a couple components that you liked that, that did move the needle, but just not enough. And go back and start again at the preparation phase and, and then conduct another optimization trial. That seems to me like a much better use of the taxpayer's money at that point than going ahead to an RCT. So it'd be really nice to have the possibility of that branching point. Yeah. Um, so what sort of window in your experience, uh, pardon me, I read that incorrectly. How fast can you achieve, can you, um, develop an initial set of optimal components after you start most? Yeah, that I, I hate to wheeze a lot of that, but yeah. I, I just think <laughs> that it's really hard to say. Um, it's so dependent on how long it takes to implement each component. Um, and then how long it takes to evaluate each component. Now, one, one thing I will say that is perhaps relevant to this is if you are developing components uh, for an intervention where the outcome of the, of the intervention is really far off in the future, and this is, this is very common in prevention of various things. It's school-based drug abuse prevention. You implement the intervention very often in, say, fifth or sixth grade, and then you evaluate it when the kids, much later when the kids are in ninth or 10th grade, because um, there's just not enough drug use, uh, fortunately, in kids who are younger than that to, to evaluate it. So, so, that, so that you don't have to wait for five years to evaluate components, this is where the conceptual model comes in and, and one place where the conceptual model is just really critical. 
I recommend that people, let me back up and say, remember that the conceptual model shows for each component which uh, mediator or mediators it's targeting. So I would recommend that in a case, the case where the outcome of ultimate interest is many years away, that you would use, I recommend to people to use the um, measures of the mediators as outcomes. And I think that's a great way to optimize uh, an intervention. It's not as good as being able to use the outcome of ultimate interest, but I think it's much better than just putting the components, untested components together uh, into um, a, a treatment package and going directly to an RCT. Your conceptual model says that each component works by uh, changing particular mediators. And I think uh, if you have faith in your conceptual model and it was carefully developed, it makes perfect sense to evaluate the, comp the components in terms of uh, how well they move the mediators. Thank you. Um, is the R01 the best mechanism for the optimization phase or do people do you use R21s or R34s? Um, people uh, use um, R30, R21s and R34s. I think the R34 is potentially a, a good mechanism um, for this, uh, for conducting just the optimization phase. But um, you saw perhaps when I went over the, the different um, funded projects, I included the grant numbers so that you could see what the different mechanisms are. And there's a lot of different, there have been a lot of different mechanisms. Uh, I've been involved in a, a few program projects, but you certainly don't need a program project to, to do this. So I think a good model is an R21 or uh, in particular an R34 for, for the optimization phase or fi finishing up the preparation phase and um, conducting the optimization phase and then uh, applying for additional funding um, depending on the outcome to conduct the evaluation phase. I think, I think that's a really good model. Great. So um, if I am conducting a factorial experiment, how would I go about managing so many experimental conditions at one time? Mm. Yeah, uh, that is a challenge. Uh, uh, certainly if, if you're uh, accustomed to a two-arm or three-arm RCT, uh, that, can, that can really be a, a big challenge. So if you're feeling uh, nervous about that, uh, I want to tell you that my collaborators on the smoking cessation study at the University of, that was done at the University of Wisconsin, um, we had 80 conditions in the field at one time. We were conducting uh, three separate optimization trials at, at one time, and, uh, and they were not done in university settings. These were, these were clinic settings, just typical primary care settings where any one of us might go uh, to see our primary care physician. So um, I think if, if they can conduct 80 conditions in the field, I think most people would have the, the ability to conduct 16 or 32 uh, experimental conditions in, in most field settings. I, I certainly don't mean every single field setting, but I think it's, it's more doable than you might think. Um, lately, uh, REDCap has become, I think has just added a lot of uh, new features, and um, the people I've been working with most recently are using REDCap to manage uh, the, the different experimental conditions and, and doing that really well. I think you have to, to use technology. Technology uh, is really what has made this possible, and uh, giving um, whoever is delivering the intervention perhaps a tablet or something similar so that whenever they need to, they can call up um, uh, a file on a particular subject and see what components that person is supposed to get and what components they're not supposed to get. Um, but, you know, there's always going to be a small number of protocol deviations, but um, we had no more than a handful, a small handful um, in the Wisconsin smoking cessation study. Also, my study with Bonnie Spring at Northwestern, we've completed that. That was 32 experimental conditions and very, very, very few uh, protocol deviations. So it's, it's possible to do it. Very good. Um, if components vary in how long they take to deliver, the length of the intervention will vary across experimental conditions. Mm -hmm. Is that a problem? That's not a problem. Um, it depends on how you want to handle it. And this brings up an interesting 
uh, feature of factorial experiments. Um, so let me go back to our friend, the two to the fourth, uh, oh, I guess it's back here, two to the fourth experimental, um, two to the fourth experiment. Um, because I want to show you that the concept of experimental control is a bit different in factorial experiments as compared to the RCT, and that is going to be an answer to this, this question. So if you look at um, what I have up on the screen now, you see that, um, for example, look at factor A. All of those conditions, one through eight, where factor A is off, that's the control for factor A. Every factor has its own control. So suppose factor A was relatively long and you felt that you needed to control for attention, say you felt you needed an attention placebo because of, of the length, you would handle that not by creating a separate control condition, a separate control experimental condition, but by making sure that all the people in experimental conditions one through eight received some alternative placebo, say, uh, treatment. So if everyone who is in conditions nine through 16 gets whatever the treatment for factor A is, and that takes an hour, you would give everyone in one through eight a treatment that takes an hour, but, but you know, is some kind of placebo treatment. So you can have different, can and should have different controls for every factor in a factorial experiment. So where it says off in this sort of generic uh, design, it could be a placebo, it could be a uh, standard of care, um, anything you can think of, a wait list, anything you can think of, it, it, it could be different across the board for these different factors. So that's how you can deal potentially with uh, controlling for the length of time that uh, a component takes if it varies across components. Very good. How do I know I'm ready to use most? Mm. I guess there's different ways you might define ready. Um, uh, well, one, th one thing I would recommend, I guess I'll take this opportunity uh, to uh, give a plug for the training that we're doing in May. That's May 14th to 18th in Washington, DC. The purpose of that training is to help people get ready for, for most. Um, you also uh, could take a look at, at my book. Um, it's because it's published by Springer. Most of you are, if you're in university settings, you're in a, uh, you will have a university library that has an arrangement with Springer that will enable you to download uh, chapters of the book for free. So I'm not even suggesting you buy it, just that, just that you uh, would download it and, and read it. So those are ways you can prepare yourself for, uh, for using most. You also um, could consider what kind of expertise you would need on your team because intervention science is nearly always team science. And today, if you were not thinking about most and uh, assembling a team, your team would uh, involve someone with content area expertise in whatever the uh, area is that the intervention is in. And also, you would probably have a methodologist or statistician on board. So you also would need, if you're using most, obviously somebody with some expertise in, in most. So um, it depends on, I guess, who is going to be that person uh, on, on, on the team. Or it could be both you and, and, a, and uh, a statistician or methodologist. So I think thinking about who... Uh, is going to be on the team uh, is, is one way to prepare yourself. Also, um, I think giving some careful thought to the conceptual model, I always feel like that's the first step, is developing that conceptual model and, and really taking care with it. Okay, great. I think we have time for uh, one more question. Sure, you okay. Think? Okay. Um, so... Are there intervention areas in which most will not work? Yeah, uh, I have, so far in my experience, I uh, haven't sent anyone away uh, who talked to me about an intervention. Um, and uh, 
said, oh, I just don't think it will work in this, in this area. But there are a couple of areas where I'll be honest and say that there are some challenges. So one area is um, in the psychotherapy area where all the components have to be delivered by a single therapist. It's, it's hard there because um, I think it, it's, it's difficult for a therapist to be told, okay, these are the components and you're going to be giving some people components A, B, and C, and you're going to be giving other people components B, C, and D. Um, it's hard for one therapist, A, to keep all that straight, and B, there's, um, there would be the constant temptation to deviate from protocol and give someone a component because the therapist thinks that the person needs the component. This is a really delicate balance to strike. Now, I'm sure everyone who's listening to my voice now understands that before you conduct an RCT, you have to have equipoise. So you have to, um, there has to be no body of evidence, scientific evidence that suggests that the treatment is better than the control at that point, which that's why you're doing an experiment. And it's the same when you're conducting an optimization trial, you have to have equipoise that you don't know whether for sure, whether any of the components work, that's why you're doing the experiment at the same time you have to get the program delivery staff excited about the components, otherwise they won't be able to deliver them properly. So that balance between getting people excited about the components, but at the same time saying, yet yeah, we don't know for sure that, that these components work, it, it's, it's, that's always hard. And I think it, it's a bigger barrier in psychotherapy research than it is in, in other types of research. I think an important way to deal with that is to be uh, recording somehow um, the the sessions and checking for, to make sure that protocol is being uh, adhered to carefully, and then giving um, giving the uh, intervention delivery person um, feedback about whether uh, there there was a protocol deviation, and doing that throughout the study, perhaps randomly selecting sessions uh, for for review. Um, so that, that's, that's one example. Another example is sometimes uh, intervention scientists have, have developed an intervention to be a gestalt so that every component is uh, necessary. I think of that as a, a K-way interaction among all the components. If you have K components, it's a K-way interaction and there's no main effects, it's just the, the, just the interaction. And so um, maybe if it's, if it's a gestalt, uh, it would be impossible to separate the components without destroying the intervention. But even if that's true, you might be interested in looking at fidelity components because it seems to me you, you might, in a case like that, you might want to optimize, try to optimize the fidelity of delivery uh, of the intervention. And I sometimes call that a sealed intervention. The intervention itself is sealed. You're not touching it. Um, but you still can optimize the way the intervention is delivered, which can be tremendously helpful. So those are two examples of, of situations where it's, it's a challenge, um, maybe a challenge, but um, probably not insurmountable. All right. Linda, thank you very much. Um, got a lot of feedback from people. Um, you can reach me at mchelpdesk at psu.edu. You can find uh, us on the Methodology Center website, methodology.psu.edu. And I encourage you to contact me, Aaron Wagner, if you have any feedback about this video. And for those of you who have submitted your email in the group chat, if you haven't done so yet, please do it if you'd like a copy of the slides. And thank you all very much for participating today. It was great to be here. Thank you.